Good morning, good afternoon or evening or morning church whenever you're watching it. I uh, thought I'd better show off my little puppy first before we start. Emily's eating a piece of army, so let me So that way he'll look at the camera. Yeah, Paddington, look at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> this is Paddington. A oh, little he looks just like a Jack Russell Terrier, but he is the size of Jack Russell Terrier and he's 12 weeks old. He's going to be like a, a big Jack Russell Terrier. He behaves like a Jack Russell Terrier. He um, faces rats and bites like anything. And he's really fun. And he even brought a dead rat into the house already, like a cat. Yuck. Anyways, thanks, Paddington. Welcome back to our Bible study on Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're continuing from verses 12 to 30. And uh, we've been through a lot uh, of this Bible study together so far. So just to remind you where we've, where we've been. And uh, use the clicks and things while I make myself smaller. Screen there. So the first part of Romans, the chapters 1 through to chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, is about the gospel and God's righteous judgment. It speaks about gospel as good news for people in a world that's gone wrong, but also explains why God is righteous in judging Jews and Gentiles alike for their lack of faith, their lack of uh, good behavior. Even though God would be righteous in doing that, God is good. And so then the next section is the gift of God's righteousness reminding us of what Christ has done in order to justify us. So chapter 3, verse 21, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and then to explain about God's grace and goodness in redeeming us. The part that we are busy with at the moment is uh, des described, chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, verse 39, the power of God's righteousness. And I think that's a very fitting, um, fitting term, the power of God's righteousness, because it speaks of the way that God's righteousness changes us. God's, we are conformed to God's righteousness because God's righteousness is so much more powerful than anything else in the world, than anything else available to anybody ever. So, so we experience that God's righteousness. Also, just to say, I've got all the windows open at home because uh, I think it's hotter outside than it is inside at the moment, even though it's cold. But that also means that there's going to be a lot of noise because it's rush hour around here. So we go back to um, chapter 5, verse 18. Um, and we're remembering, we're talking about the power of, of God's righteousness. And we go to chapter 5, verse 18. And we remember the brokenness that entered the world because of one person's sin. Therefore, just as one man's trespass, led to condemnation for also one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. And when we're talking about the power of God's righteousness, we're reminded that the nature of the whole universe, the nature of the whole world is changed because of what one man has done. And so Jesus' act, act in being obedient to God, Jesus' act in offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross, is an act of, of changing the nature of everything. All of creation is suddenly fundamentally different. The world is changed. And we are reminded of that in terms of the image of baptism. We have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And so this image of, of God's righteousness and being powerful is like um, in one of the images is like a, a seal being stamped onto soft wax and the wax is then conformed into the image of the seal because of of the strength of the seal and the malleability of the wax this is the idea of the power of god's righteousness which overwhelms the world so we're reminded of those images of of baptism of dying and rising again of receiving new life through god so these images remind us the power of God's righteousness that comes into our lives to overwhelm us and make us righteous despite our own brokenness. 
But this power of God's righteousness comes into a, a sort of practical action as we talk about how God's righteousness through the Holy Spirit works in our lives to make us holy. So in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 uh, uh, through to 10, sorry, just that large scripture there, um, Paul speaks about the gift of the commandment uh, against covetousness. And he says, it, it produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now we could say is this sort of reverse psychology where I suddenly covet things because I know I shouldn't. It's like you never wanted to go to the beach, but then you heard you weren't allowed to go to the beach, and now you want to go to the beach all the time, or, or things like that. Um, it's like when I put my mask on my nose, my, and I know I mustn't touch my face, then my, my nose starts to get itchy. But it's not that kind of reverse psychology that Paul is speaking of. He's speaking of how this commandment revealed something inside a human being that, that is an inward desire that causes us to sin and, and ends up causing a mess. And so Eugene Peterson's um, message translation has a nice way of putting it. Uh, those lines in, in green there. Apart from the succinct surgical command in, in green, you shall not covet, could have dressed covetous up to look like a virtue and ruined my life with it. And then in the red parts, I'm going backwards, the law code had a perfectly legitimate function. Without its clear guidelines for right and wrong, moral behavior would be mostly guesswork. And so the, the evil inside of us is revealed through the law. It doesn't appear through the law, but we understand it. And we understand the nature of our, our death and our struggle. So this righteous power of God is helping us to be transformed. Chapter 7, Paul is pointing out the difficulty of, of becoming righteous and, and showing us that it's, that it's a hard job. But then, chapter 8, we start to talk about the life in the Spirit and the gift that God gives us. So with the arrival of Jesus, this is again Peterson's translation or paraphrase, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. Therefore, though, therefore now no condemnation in a more normal translation. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air. In the other translation, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. And so there's this, this conundrum where we talk about how life in the spirit leads to life and life in the flesh leads to death. And uh, the nature of that death and the nature of that life is what this is about. So some people just reduce it to hell. And, and, and heaven, I don't think it's meant to be that way. I think it's meant to be about the kind of life that sin produces in you, which is actually a life of death, or uh, the life that the Spirit produces in you, which is a life that is worth living, a life that is, that is full of life. And so in verse 9 of chapter 8, Paul reminds us, you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. But this reminds us that, that we have, have, have spirit life, not flesh life. We have spirit life, and this spirit life is life-giving. It's life upon life to give us life. And then he goes on in verse 12, which is where our Bible study officially starts today. And I realized I didn't pray when I began. So as we get to the part where we are uncovering new parts of Scripture, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us together to, to worship and to study the scriptures in this different way. And we ask that through your Holy Spirit you'd help us to understand what it is that you are saying to us today through the words of a simple preacher, so that we would hear your truth and not our own truth, and believe your truth and not our So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. So we continue with Romans chapter 8 and going from verse Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the mis misdeeds of the body, I went backwards when I should have gone forwards. 
<clears throat> if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so the first part is interesting, this idea of there being an obligation. Speaking of an obligation not to the sinful nature, but to the spiritual nature. And so this word obligation is um, described as debt in some, some versions. And I think it, a better word for it might be inclination. So the Greek word there is opheletes. Oh, give my pronunciation. One who is obligated to do something, who is obliged to, who must do something. One who must obey the whole law. But it seems to mean more than just uh, being in debt or being obliged or, or being somehow um, under sort of compunction. But rather because uh, you are spirit powered rather than flesh powered. You know, the flesh doesn't drive us in a way that we feel guilty if we do not uh, satisfy the needs of the flesh. The flesh just gives us a hunger and an inclination towards overindulging or all of those things that we might want to do because of the flesh. But the Spirit gives us an inclination towards love and kindness and all those spiritual inclinations. Not so much an obligation as in this guilt weighing heavily upon us, but rather as if it is this inclination, as if the world is sloping in the direction of, of God's will for all, all of us. So we speak of living by the Spirit. And in verse 13, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So we're reminded that God calls us not just to, to live in our own power, but to live with the help of the Spirit. And this verse that says, by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, reminds us of Ephesians chapter 6, that one that we, that we love. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And reminds us again of chapter 4, verse 12 of Hebrews, which says, Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A reminder to us that, that through the Holy Spirit, through God's power, we are, are, are able to be transformed. And we're able to change our lives. So we are also invited to remember the nature of living and dying. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. We die a bit every time we, we are disobedient to God. All the, all the sin and brokenness that we, that we are inclined towards, we die a little bit inside for all of that. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And so we receive life in, in, in all of its fullness, a greater life, a stronger life, a better life, because we are filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit. So I speak of this word obligation as maybe more properly being a word inclination. And we understand that all of these aspects of life have implications for us. You live by the flesh, you will die, but if you live by the Spirit, you will live. And those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, reminding us that we are children of God. We, we have it in our DNA, in our genetic makeup at the end of verse 14, to, to be inclined towards godly behavior, godly activities. A Spirit that does not make you a slave to fear, but a Spirit of sonship, different to, to being fearful and, and under debt or under guilt to do what God would have you do, but doing what God would have you do because it is in your nature. And the original intention of your created being is, is being restored. And by that we cry, Abba, Father, this intimate word of relationship with God. And the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 
And so this, this speaks of the closeness of God to us in, in our realizing our identity as God's children, that this very spirit, this word for breath, this very breath in us, um, helps us to realize our identity as God's children. I was with my new puppy last night, and it's a bit, bit disgusting, but puppies are funny like that. I was trying to get him to go to sleep, and he insisted on going to sleep with his nose against my nose, and and uh, he could feel that that warm, soft puppy breath uh, against my nose. The same thing is with families. We are called to breathe together. Um, you know, we're not allowed to breathe with anybody else at the moment because we might spread the coronavirus. But as family, we can breathe next to each other and share that breath or live in the same room. And there's that sense of being family with God, that we breathe the same spirit. That spirit says that we are, are God's children, that we are heirs. And as we are heirs of God, we, we are heirs to the... To, to, Sometimes when we see heir, we think, oh, inheritance, I'm going to get rich. But it's not about that. It's about um, hereditary features. And we become like Christ, co-heirs with God, co-heirs with Christ, sharing in his sufferings that we also may share in his glory. And so we also um, get to this part where we speak of sharing in, in sufferings, and we think, oh, my goodness, I don't really like sufferings. But um, let's get on to that later. We're talking now about the last part, about how we share in his glory. And this takes us back to, all the way back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned uh, and fall short of the glory of God. And so here in this passage, we're starting to realize that that glory can be restored. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective. So back in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24 and 25, we're anticipating this long argument that we're going to start realizing in chapter 8. Now we must remember that we in the 21st century are used to short little sound bites of information. We're not used to this long argument and we not very good at holding it all in at once. And so we end up using Roman sort of proof text here, proof text there, and we don't absorb the whole context of the whole passage, the whole of the whole book. But in, in, in Paul's day, in the early church day, they might even sit and read it. And to read Romans was, was like watching TV because uh, people liked plays back then. They liked long, boring things because they could memorize words and things much better than we can because they, they practice that instead of what we do is, uh, is writing things down and being able to Google things quickly. And so this Romans chapter 3 verse 23 is, being, um, is coming to its, to its conclusion, its, its logical conclusion here in, in Romans chapter 8 where we speak of sharing in God's but there's also the difficult idea of, of suffering, and we're not really big into suffering, I don't think. And uh, we share in his sufferings as we also share in his glory. And the, the word is sympasko, which is like sympathy. We, we suffer together, but we are also glorified together. And I'm not even going to try and say that big word. But that glory language is about, you know, receiving... The, the praise that's due, but it's mostly about sharing in that light that God's glory is. To become not just uh, praised, but praiseworthy. Praiseworthy because of the inward nature that has been transformed into Christ-likeness and goodness. As we also think about what it means to, to think of, of suffering and sharing in his suffering, that same word for suffering is, comes up in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, as Jesus prepares to share the Passover with his disciples. I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so we think about that word of suffering and we think of that what Jesus is doing is dying. We're invited to put to death the deeds of the body. Oh, I have to move my head again on the screen. There we go put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, reminding of the, the Spirit's power 
spirit of the word of God that speaks to us, but also uh, of the spirit as a as a helper in our lives, uh, and this in being invited to to suffer a little bit is maybe to give up some of the things that we thought were so important to us, so that we could share in 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 Christ's glory. So it's not easy uh, necessarily being generous or patient or all of those things that you are meant to be or forgiving. We are called to suffer as Christ suffered, um, to rather not as but with Christ. And as we suffer with Christ, we put to death the things that we want in our bodies and we desire more fully Christ. So we're reminded of that beautiful gift of Christ's suffering for us, Christ's passion, and our capacity to share in the gift that he has given. Let me move on to verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. So speaking of that glory of being revealed as children of God. For the creation waits with eager longing for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our body. So as we're thinking about the suffering that, that Paul is talking about and suffering together and, and all of those, those words, we realize that this suffering is towards a higher purpose, a better thing, the realization of God's will in creation. Realizing that way back then when, when Adam made his decision, we, all creation, fell into disrepair. And now as Christ has made his decision, all creation is being transformed and renewed and it's like childbirth. His children are being revealed, the, the, the children of God. And so we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. So there's this idea that we've, we've been adopted into God's family, but at the moment we, we're being transformed into more of God's likeness, to being more loving and caring and all of those good things. And we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption because somehow the Spirit speaks to us when we, when we aren't those people that we ought to when we aren't loving in the way that we ought to be loving and all of those things. And so we are changed. And then Paul speaks about the redemption of our bodies. And he's spoken about this kind of thing already, speaking about how the flesh wants to do one thing, but the will wants to do another. But here in Romans 8, he's speaking about how the Spirit intersects our flesh and starts to change us and renew us and helps us to become the people that God would have us. For in hope we were saved. A hope that is seen is not hope. Or who hopes for what is seen? But don't think that everybody's going to be perfect. If Paul is talking to, to a Jew and a Gentile, and the Gentiles complaining about how the Jews in this community are behaving, and the Jew is behaving how the Gentiles in this community are behaving, if we complain about how the other members of our Christian churches behave, then this is what we should say. We should say that hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is seen we're reminded that god's able to transform each and every one of us desmond tutu fun affectionately says there is no such thing as a hopeless case for if we hope for what we do not see we wait for it with patience likewise this is why we should be peace be patient with ourselves and with each other the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so this Romans chapter 8 starts to help us to understand how we can be transformed. So we've gone from understanding the brokenness of the world and, and sin and, and all of those terrible things, to being able to understand the, God's righteousness and how God makes us righteous with himself through his justifying death on the cross and all of that complicated theology. 
But now in Romans chapter 8, we learn about the power of God's righteousness to transform us. And in this righteousness, we experience God's breath breathing within us. And in that breath breathing within us, we realize deep intimacy with God that helps us to know that we breathe together with God and we have such a close relationship with God that God's will is made known in our groaning, God understands our groans and our, and our brokenness and through the Spirit helps us to understand what we are going through. That brings us then to, to verse 28, which is, I think, often misused. Uh, it's one of those ones that people bring up when we want to understand why there's suffering in the world and why things go wrong. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to and sometimes uh, when you go through tough times, someone says, oh, but God's not in control and all things work together for good, you know, for those who love God. That's not what Paul is saying. He's not setting out in verse 28 to explain uh, evil and, and why there's suffering in the world. In verse 28, he is helping us to understand what it means to be conformed to Christ-likeness, to understand why life is sometimes tough and why in our suffering we, we, we experience suffering when we, we follow Jesus more closely. And he is at an angle helping us to understand how suffering can, can help us to become more Christ-like. But this verse is not about the problem of suffering and struggle in the world. It's about discipleship about learning to become more Christ-like, about learning to follow Jesus more closely. And so uh, in the I International Varsity Press um, New Testament Bible commentary, the comment is that for Paul, the ultimate good of these hardships is their work in conforming believers to Christ's image. And so this whole passage is all about being conformed to Christ's image. To, it's about becoming Christ-like, being renewed in his image. No, my remote, stop. Press the button. Use my phone. So we speak of that verse that says we we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So we're speaking again about not just being children of God by identity, but being children of God by the way that we imitate God's love and God's will and God's person in the world. Then, in order that he might be the firstborn, within a large family. Those whom he predestined, he also called. So speaking of predestined and called, it's a reminder of that special relationship we have with God. Not just about how um, Gentiles and Jews belong to the kingdom of God. It's literally vocation, God calling us into our identity and being God, helping us to realize who we really are. God has called us out, He's also justified us. And we're reminded that, that God doesn't just call the people that we like. God doesn't, doesn't just call our friends. God calls, calls everybody. And so the Jew is reminded that Gentiles are also called. And the Gentiles reminded that Jews are also called. And we who try to keep the doors of the church must realize that if Christ has, has called people by name and they have heard his voice, they are called to belong too. And who are we to turn them away? up to him to, to predestine and to call, and to call personally. And those whom he calls, he justifies. Those whom he justifies, he also glorifies. Though we are able to realize the beauty of the presence and the image of God in everybody we meet, because he has justified and glorified those whom he has called, and who are we to decide who is called and who and so in chapter 1 of uh, chapter 1 to 3 of Romans the gospel and God's righteous chapter 3 verse 21 to 5 verse 21 the gift of God's righteousness 
in the part that we're reading now, and we just got a few more verses to, to the end of 39, the power of God's righteousness. Now that power is, is placed into our hearts to transform us and help us become the people that we are created to. And so as we close, I invite us to pray. Loving God, thank you for your righteousness. That in your righteousness you call us to belong to your family. You renew us, transform us, and shed your love abroad in our hearts. And so help us to put to death those things that drag us away from you. May your spirit breathe deep within our beings. May your spirit breathe life into us, defeating the disease of sin and sparking new health and new life so that we could live the way of your spirit in liveliness, fullness. Loving God, we lift up to you the world that we live in that's just going through a horrific time at the moment. We're not sure of the consequences of, of the economic fallout of all the brokenness of this time. So we ask that you would give us new eyes, as if we were born again, to see new possibilities in a world that is in desperate need of renewal. So we know that all people and all creation long for the revealing of the children of God, and each of us in, our, in the depths of our hearts longs to be known more carefully and more clearly as your child and your children. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, and uh, I look forward to worshipping with you if you're there uh, online on Sunday. The weather looks very cold, so I don't think we'll be able to do the drive-in church again, um, but uh, wait for further notices. Have a lovely evening.